I really appreciate the invitation to come and speak with you guys today. Um, I was, I'm actually really excited to speak. Um, I like doing it. It's really something I haven't been doing for very long, but it's been a huge blessing to me in the three or four times I've had the chance to uh, present a sermon. So I hope that what I have to say today will just, um, more than anything, just help you grow closer to God. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I ask that the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, the things that I've been thinking about and wanting to present today will bring glory and honor to you and you only. I pray this in your name. Amen. To everything, there is a season, a time for every purpose under the sun, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to uproot, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search, a time to count it as lost, a time to keep, and a time to discard a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time of love, a time of hate, a time of war, a time of peace. I think we're all pretty familiar with this verse or these verses, but why did God feel that it was necessary to put that in the Bible? What's actually going on here? What is it telling us? The interesting thing is that the author had the same question and he says, what do we gain from all this toil? Verse 11, I think it kind of wraps it all up. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men, and yet they cannot fathom the work that God has done from the beginning to the end. What God does is certainly beyond our capacity to understand these, these things, a time for this, a time for that, a time for this, a time for that. These, this is a picture of our everyday life. It's the stuff that we do. And God is telling us that in the midst of it all, even in the stuff that feels like chaos, he will make it all beautiful. Unless we get all wigged out about how it's going to happen, he reminds us, don't worry about it. I've got a plan. I've got it figured out. And even if I told you, you wouldn't even be able to understand it. This really resonates with me personally. Um, I'm a work in progress. Thank goodness it's not done now. In God's perfect time and in his perfect way, he will complete in me what he has started. And that gives me great hope. As I was reading these verses in scripture, I was contemplating the theme seasons of life and specifically the winter season. And I wanted to share with you some of the spiritual takeaways um, and lessons that I personally have seen and been convicted of and found great hope in through my contemplations. There are so many similarities, allegories between the seasons of the year and our personal walk with God our walk with God. That's what the scripture reading was. All those things that we do, that's our walk with God. A time for this, a time for that. So as we talk together today, I want you to focus on how is God using the stuff in your life and making it beautiful. Winter is just leaving. We're actually spring, but it kind of feels a little bit like winter still. The grass is still brown. The trees are still bare. The fields are still unplanted. And we're in this season of rest and waiting. There's a dormancy right now. The fullness of the seasons past are completed and we wait. We wait with an expectation of something yet to be, something more to come, hope. And we wait knowing that although it looks, although, knowing that although it doesn't look like it under the ground, there's a lot going on. I can't see it, but I know it's happening. There is preparation going on that must occur for next year's spring to do what spring does, bring forth fullness of life. 
The leaves that have fallen are breaking down and providing nutrients for the soil and microbes and the microorganisms in the earth are hard at work in their mighty underground kingdom. I wish we had a chance to talk more about what goes on with all of that decomposition. It fascinates me that there's an entire underworld working in my little garden plot throughout the winter season. Although when I look out, all I see is cold, hard dirt. And isn't that so similar to our lives? Life might seem like it's at a standstill. Or maybe you feel like the fullness of life has passed you by. And there is uncertainty of what is yet to come. <clears throat> but under all of that is an unseen promise of more. There's hope. I, l I personally love winter. Usually I hear boo. We have a long winter, but I love winter. I love the snow. Um, the busyness of Thanksgiving and Christmas and, uh, and winter break and um, all the school plays, that's over. And there's this long pause until spring. I love walking in the cold and the stillness of winter. I love how the snow just dampens the sound and there's a quietness in winter that you, there's no other time of year that feels like that. I love how the newly fallen snow just buries all of the unsightly stuff and it turns the landscape into this picture of perfection. And one of the other reasons that I love winter is because I know it won't last forever. I have hope. I know that in the spring there will be a renewing and an awakening, and I'm confident in the consistency and the order of nature and the seasons. I'm confident in God that he will work his mysteries in the spring, and in the spring my garden will again burst forth in new life and yield another bountiful harvest of tomatoes. And I cannot wait to have another tomato sandwich. It's this time of year that you just long for that lush taste of a fresh tomato. There's nothing in the grocery store like that right now. But winter isn't always a time that's filled with hope. It's not always that snuggly, warm feeling with a cup of hot cocoa, sitting by a fire with your friends and your family. The seasons have gone badly. If the spring plantings were washed away, if the harvest was slim, the rains came late, ruined the crops, then winter is no longer a season of rest and hope. It's a season of torment and enduring, this endless waiting. It's a cold hunger and a depleting of resources, a scrambling to piece together some sort of new plan. And our lives are a lot like that too. Our best laid plans, our hopes, our dreams, despite our best efforts, might not be going the way you thought they were going to go. Things might not be working out quite right. This is how winter is an allegory to life. But winter is also an allegory for my spiritual walk with God. And maybe not just mine, but maybe yours too. The winter of my spiritual life can be filled with rest, renewal, or it can be frozen and lifeless, dormant, or it can be a combination of the two. Filled with hope, despite the current observation that nothing is going on. I noticed that you guys have Bibles in all of the pews, and I like that. Um, if you didn't bring one, or if you don't have your iPhone to turn on, or a phone to turn on, um, jump to 1 Samuel 30, 1 to 25. This is a fantastic story. Um, I'm going to run through it pretty quickly. So um, it's a little bit of a long story, but I think the whole, the, the story as a whole encompasses several different ideas that I want to talk about. So 1 Samuel 30, 1 to 25. On the third day, David and his men arrived in Ziklag, and the Amalek Amalekites had raided the Negev, attacked Ziklag, and burned it down. They had taken captive the women and 
and all the children, both young and old. They had not killed anyone, but had carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men came to the city, they found it burned down and their wives and their sons and their daughters taken captive. So David and the troops with him lifted up their voices and they wept until they had no more strength left to weep. David's two wives, Ahinoam and Abigail, had been taken captive, and David was greatly distressed because the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of every man grieved for his sons and his daughters. But David found strength in the Lord his God. You got to remember that phrase. Then David said to Abathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. So Abathar brought it to him. And David inquired of the Lord, should I pursue these raiders? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, the Lord replied, for you will surely overtake them and rescue the captives. So David and his 600 men went to the brook Bezor, where some stayed behind because 200 men were too exhausted to cross the brook. But David and 400 men continued on in pursuit. Now, his men found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David. They gave the man water to drink and food to eat, a piece of fig cake and two clusters of raisins. So he ate and he was revived, for he had not had food or water for three days and nights. Then David said to him, to whom do you belong and from where are you from? I'm an Egyptian, he replied, the slave of an Amalekite. My master abandoned me here three days ago when I fell ill. We raided the Negev, the territory of Judah, the Negev of Caleb, and we burned down Ziklag. Will you lead me to these raiders, David asked. And the man replied, oh, swear to me by my God that you will not kill me or deliver me to the hand of my master, and I will lead you to them. So he led David down, and there were the Amalekites spread out all over the land, eating and drinking and celebrating the great amount of plunder that they had taken from the land of the Philistines and the land of Judah. And David struck them down from twilight until the evening of the next day. Not a man escaped except for 400 young men who fled off riding camels. So David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Nothing was missing, young or old, son or daughter, or any of the plunder the Amalekites had taken. David brought everything back, and he recovered all the flocks and the herds, which his men drove ahead of the other livestock, calling out, this is David's plunder. When David came to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow him from the brook of Bezor, they came out to meet him and the troops with him. As David approached the men, he greeted them. But all the wicked and worthless men among those who David had gone out with said, because they did not go with us, we will not share with them the plunder that we recovered, except for each man's, man, uh, each man's wife and children. They may take them and go. But David said, my brothers, you must not do this with what the Lord has given us. He has protected us and delivered us into the hand of the raiders who came against us. Who will listen to your proposal? The share of the one who went to battle will match the share of the one who stayed behind with the supplies. They will share alike. And so it was, so it has been from that day forward. David established the statues of an ordinance for Israel to this very day. What a story. A day in the life. David and his army have just returned home from battle, exhausted, only to find their homes destroyed and their families captured. And rather than the expected rest, they have to head out on a rescue mission. There are so many times in our lives we think we're going to have a period of rest. Everything seems to be coming together, only to find that it's not so. Those transitions can be so hard on us. The soldiers, they're physically and emotionally spent, and they head back out on the warpath, and they come to this place called Bezor, and it's got a brook there, a place to drink and be refreshed. They stop to get a drink, and then they head out again. But 200 of the men are just 
too tired to go on. They stay behind as the others leave to rescue the captured families. How worn out must a person be to not go rescue his wife and children? My friends, that's not sleepy. That's not tired. That's exhaustion. It's a physical weariness that many of us have not known. Charlie might know it. Tanya might know it. At least it's not a weariness, an exhaustion that we know as is presented in this story, but how many of us are worn out spiritually? So worn out that we'd rather not come to church where we can be renewed, refreshed, and encouraged. And yet we know that it's by our example that children learn. They see us come to church where we can fall at the feet of God, where true restoration takes place. And they learn that God can be trusted to meet us where we are, to heal us, to restore us. But we just don't have it in us to lead. How many of us would rather not participate in spiritual things because the idea of doing any self-examination is just too overwhelming? And yet we know because God tells us so that when we allow examination of ourselves, he will show us where we need him. He will lead us exactly where we need to go. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my concerns. See if there is any offensive way in me. Lead me in a way everlasting. How tired must we be that when God throws us a lifeline, we don't even take a hold of it. Tired out, burned out, worn out, tuned out, and our souls just so torched that we don't even care anymore. That's the modern day equivalent of where David's 200 men were. But the story doesn't end there. There's some beautiful stuff yet to come. When the men returned with the women and children and the spoils of battle, the men who had done all the work didn't want to share with the ones who stayed behind and rested. Isn't that so like our human nature? I did the work, I get the stuff. You didn't do the work, you don't get the stuff. But that's not how God works. David knew his forces needed to remain united. Not sharing the bounty would separate them. It would divide them. It would shame them. And the la that's the last thing he wanted for men who needed to continue to fight together. And his words were, don't do that after all the Lord has given us. The Lord fought the battle for them. He won it for them. It wasn't their strength or their might. David was helping the warriors to refocus on where their strength and their victory came from. We need that refocusing too. My friends, when we are burned out to the point of needing this kind of rest, we need to allow others to help us. We need to reach out and say, I'm at the end of my rope. I don't know how to go on. I've got nothing left to give. I just don't care anymore. <clears throat> My friend Joey struggled with addictions for the majority of his adult life. He posted this on Facebook. It's a question. It was a little survey. Is it harder to say, A, I'm sorry, B, I need help. C, I love you. Across the board, the answer was, ask for help. You're not alone in that struggle. Praise God that my friend did ask for help. He's a whole new man. And he shares this prayer. <clears throat> May God help us with our unbelief in truly needing help from others. God, forgive me for not asking and believing in the help that you provide from others. It's a humble prayer that I need to pray. 
And those of us that have the energy need to pick up the battle for them. We need to be their Brook Bezor resting place. We don't look at our watches and count how long they've been down. We don't count the days or the years or the number of times they've been out of the fight, avoiding relationships, dodging the work that needs to be done, never saying yes when they're asked to help out. David's men all knew that some of the troops had stayed behind. This wasn't some sort of a secret. And I think it empowered those to fight all the harder, knowing that they were fighting not just for themselves, but for the ones who couldn't fight. Many of us here today need that kind of rest. The world has beaten us down, and we're finding ourselves too broken to move forward, too fearful to step up, too hurt to invest, too traumatized by our failures to get up just too tired to fight and too ashamed to complain, too proud to ask for help, too unbelieving in God's rescue plan. And we sit at our Brook Bezor in our own private spiritual winter. This is God's invitation to you. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. What an invitation. What a God of mercy. Here's what I want you to know. It's okay to rest. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. Jesus is your David. He will fight for you. I'm so glad that God understands my need for rest. I urge you to fight for one another. Support each other. Encourage one another. Pray for one another. For we must remain united for the next battle. How could we do elsewise after all God has done for us? God never leaves us without hope. And when we have nothing left to give, God still does it all for us. This is so powerful. You can rest in the love of God for you. He's so passionate about you that he would go to the lengths he did, dying on the cross to fight for you. Sometimes a winter walk can feel a lot like a time of desperation. Ken likes to watch this show called Alone. I'm hooked on it now, too. I don't know how many seasons we've watched. It's good. It's a group of people, if you don't know the show, it's a group of people who try to live alone in the wilderness as long as possible, completely by themselves, only their own resources. They start out in the fall. There's plenty of food. Well, there's some food. There's food, and, and there's warmth to get through the days, but eventually winter comes. The water sources freeze over, and now just to drink, they have to gather firewood, make a fire, gather the ice, melt it. The easy food supplies are gone, and every meal is now a long day's work with no guarantee that there's actually going to be a meal. The hunger and deprivation and the cold set in. The amount of work and energy it takes just to stay warm is tremendous. And it takes a huge toll on their bodies. And the danger becomes very real. When you aren't eating and when you're not sleeping and when you're so cold and living so close to the edge of death, your brain just stops working and you start to make foolish decisions, stupid mistakes. And in those desperate conditions, one slip up, one foolish mistake can take you out. It's like that too. When we are in a spiritual winter, we become so totally focused on our self-preservation. We make the worst decisions when we are in a spiritual deep freeze. 
We make wrong turns because we're not thinking clearly. We make moves that we'll regret because we're momentarily desperate. If you are in a spiritual deep freeze, you are in a dangerous place. Every day feels empty and you look for some way to be filled, but nothing works. And you end up frustrated and angry, disappointed, ready to tap out. And most of the time, just blaming God. I know I've been there. King David said to be a man after God's own heart, spent many seasons in a spiritual deep freeze. But there were also times when he was not in a spiritual deep freeze. And I want to highlight some of the things that he was characterized by during his high points. Here's how he coped. 1 Samuel 23, 2, David inquired of the Lord. 1 Samuel 23, 4, David inquired of the Lord. 1 Samuel 30, verse 8, David inquired of the Lord. 2 Samuel 2, 1, David inquired of the Lord. 2 Samuel 5, 19, David inquired of the Lord. 2 Samuel 5, 23, David inquired of the Lord. Do you see the trend? Do you see the pattern? When David's life was on track, this is what he was characterized by. And at the end of each of those is this part that I love. And the Lord answered him. Over and over and over this happened. So much so that there's yet one more phrase that you see a lot. And David found strength in the Lord his God. David made his first priority to ask God what his will was. And when he did this consistently, he was not in the winter of his life. His relationship with God was not stagnant. There was a vibrancy to their relationship such that David found strength in the Lord, his God. When I look at the winters of my life, when I look at the winters of my relationship with God, when there were vast periods of nothingness, I can honestly say that I was not inquiring of the Lord. I wasn't hearing from him because I wasn't asking for him. And if I did happen to ask, I didn't really want to hear the answer. What I was doing was listening to myself, taking my own advice. What I was seeking was affirmation and validation for what I wanted. I didn't want to make any changes. I didn't want to change. I wanted everyone else to change. I wanted everything else to change. And worse, I listened to the advice of others that were as lost and miserable as me. We gravitate toward those who are miserable when we're miserable. But desperate, self-absorbed friends don't give very good advice. And honestly, we don't need commiseration we need wise counsel, course correction. Friends, find yourselves wise counsel. God never asked you to do this alone. We're never meant to go it alone. Find a Bible study group, find a mentor, find a prayer partner. Proverbs 15, reminds us that without consultation and wise advice, plans are frustrated. But with many counselors, they are established and succeed. When you are in that spiritual deep freeze, stop listening to yourself. Inquire of the Lord. Start talking to God. Talk to God. Talk to God. Talk to God who understands and invites you to put your trust and your hope in him. We're going to go through a whole bunch of scriptures right now. If you want to write them down, go ahead. If you want to just listen, that's fine too. 2 Corinthians 4, 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though the outer self is wasting away, yet our inner self is being renewed day by day. Isn't that so much what happens in winter? Outside, it ain't looking so good. But inside, stuff is happening. 
Isaiah 40, 31. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. The hope that is placed in God is like no other hope. Psalm 57, 1. Be merciful to me, God. Be merciful to me, for my soul trusts in you. In the shadow of your wing will I make my refuge until these calamities are over. Life isn't always easy. David speaks with such vulnerability here. Be merciful to me, God. Be merciful to me. Because he found himself in winter over and over and over again. And when we find ourselves once again in winter time, our life or our life just isn't in a place that we need to be. God is so merciful to us and we can hide next to him while we wait for the winter to pass. Matthew 6, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Do you hear it? And David inquired of the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. This verse is just loaded with course correcting advice straight from the heart of God. 2 Corinthians 4 8, we are hard pressed on all sides, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair. God will never leave us in despair. I will never leave you or forsake you, he says. He already has a plan. I know the plans I have for you, plans to give you hope, a future. And he's already made a way and there is hope for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him may not, we will not perish, but have everlasting life. There is an end to winter. A couple of years ago, to my garden, I added several bales of hay truckloads of manure, wood chips. I really didn't like having that stuff in my garden because I love to be out in my garden barefoot. That's a soft dirt. I don't know. There's just something about that that I love. But those wood chips, they were constantly poking my feet. And I was not happy with the advice to have put those in. I wasn't going to put them in. But some person was like, oh, no, you got these great wood chips. Put them in your garden. The seasons have gone by now. And the chips and the hay have lain under a blanket of snow, apparently dormant. But now when I go out and I dig up the shovelfuls of dirt, I no longer see the hay. I no longer see the wood chips. And I don't smell that rank waft of manure. Winter has done its magic. And in its quietness has changed my garden dirt. My tomato plants can't use chunks of wood but they can certainly use the nutrients that's in them as they change and decompose. And they have to change for my seeds to be, and my plants to be able to use them. Without change, they can't be used. Without change, there can't be growth. And so it is with my life again. I don't know about you, but I don't like change. Anybody love change? I don't like change. Unless, of course, it's my idea to change. And then it's revolutionary. But if change is forced on me, oh man, I'm going to dig my heels in. You're going to have to pull me. There's going to be some passive aggressive stuff going on because I don't like to be told what to do. I whine about it. The whining goes on and on. Oh, why am I so stubborn and resistant? And I love that God never forces change on us. He waits for us to ask for it. And David begged God to change him and create something new in him. 
Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Ah, one that's not so resentful and irritable and cold and hard. But what's so important about being changeable and moldable? This verse is one of the hardest verses to read and to take to heart. It's found in Ephesians 4, 18. They are darkened in their understanding and alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their hearts. So what's actually happening when I'm having a spiritual winter and not seeking God's input? And if I am, I'm not actually willing to listen to it and be changed by it. That's the reality of my situation. It's because of the hardness of my heart. That's a hard truth to accept. It's only when I'm truly changeable toward God and ask for his presence in my life that that change starts to occur. I see it not as God doing something for me, but God doing something in me. He starts the transformation of me. And that transformation just blows my mind. I still can't believe I'm standing here today. I can't comprehend, much less produce in myself this, this change. It's something that God does for me. I cannot in my stubbornness even desire to have a soft heart toward God. But God, in his miraculous way, puts that desire in me. To go back to the very first verses that we read, he has set in your heart. He has set eternity in your heart. And they cannot fathom the work of God from the beginning of time to the end. I still shake my head at this. God is so good. 1 Thessalonians 5.24, the one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. He will do it. Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. God is faithful. He will do it. That brings me so much hope. And that really is the part of winter that I love the most. It reminds me that even in the midst of the difficulties of life, the realities that suck, underlying all of the uncertainty is this tremendous hope, which is Jesus. Don't be afraid. Change is happening. Winter will end and hope is here. <laughs>